for those who don't know, I'm James Fuccione from the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative. And the Technology Learning Collaborative for Healthy Aging sounds very similar, but we have all of these overlapping uh, focus areas and priorities that you're going to see as I, as I move along. But uh, Catherine, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll say that our focus is promoting and supporting inclusive age and dementia friendly communities. And so that is that takes many different forms, but uh, the World Health Organization was the, was the one who started uh, this movement to help cities, towns and regions, states uh, and territories become age uh, friendly, age and dementia friendly. And with that, there are some sort of key features, uh, including you could see in bold uh, font here, they are age friendly environments are accessible, equitable, inclusive, safe and secure and supportive and recognizing that older people play a crucial role in their communities. Next slide, please, Catherine. So the, the World Health Organization and later AARP put together uh, a framework known as the eight domains for those working uh, deeply in this movement, uh, which we expanded on when we aligned with the dementia friendly community movement which means that based off community feedback, any city or town or region can focus on um, any number of areas or priorities that make it that would make an impact uh, to improving the lives of older adults in, in that geography. One thing that wasn't included was technology. And so we have, since the pandemic, uh, have added technology as part of our framework, along with um, a range of resources and examples from communities including a web page that I'm going to talk about in a, in a few moments uh, to help communities uh, kind of connect the dots uh, with all these different features. Next slide, please. And so here's that website. Uh, thanks to Catherine, Molly, and a number of other uh, partners that we have. We have a website. If you go to the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative website, you can click on resources. And on the left-hand tab, we have a page dedicated to digital equity resources. And if you scroll down, we have just tons of information, uh, different funding opportunities that come up periodically and, and just different ways of thinking about how to bridge this divide um, in your city or town. Next slide, please. And when we, you know, early on when we talked about the issue of the digital divide or digital equity, we've promoted it as uh, a social determinant of health. And if you're not familiar with that term, this is sort of one of the many visuals that have been created to explain and articulate social determinants of health, which are uh, a collection of factors that, you know, impact people's health, well being, including life expectancy and just quality of life. So you can see all these different categories, but in thinking about technology, it's not really, you know, by itself as a category, it's really a cross cutting theme across all of these different categories. So when you think about technology use and older adults using technology, it can be for any number of these categories. So that's just one way that we frame the issue uh, when we present, when we talk about it. Next slide, please. And we also were uh, proud to be part of a report uh, funded by Tufts Health Plan Foundation that involves our colleagues at EOEA and others and conducted by FSG that talked about how communities responded, uh, how innovative community responses to COVID supported healthy aging. Um, and so something that will not be a surprise to anyone here that older adults disproportionately impacted by the pandemic included those with limited access or proficiency with technology. And while communities initially focused on meeting basic needs of older adults, those needs shifted over time to focus on social connection, uh, stable housing mobility, and other connection and other um, conditions that affect well-being. Um, and technology was a critical part of all these responses. And in sort of a mirror image of that first bullet, the older adults and their families who did have access to technology were able to seek out a wider array of information services social connections and all doing all that more quickly and organizations were able to, <laughs> able to reach older adults more effectively. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of reports and data that we've pointed to that we've used in our advocacy on state and local level to help communities through this, 
Uh, this comes from the Essex County Community Foundation. And so what they looked at was, and, and they're doing a lot on this. If you go to their website, you can see a lot of uh, work that they're doing in that region. Um, so here they say that uh, they focus on uh, internet use among older adults um, in different communities across the county with uh, older adults in Peabody you, uh, reporting internet use 62%, um, and then in, up to North Andover 78%. Um, and they noted that stigma sometimes limits efforts to help older adults, but telehealth is just one area where digital access could be transformative. Next slide, please. And so for every other community, what we have available uh, in our Healthy Aging Data Report, again, going back to our website, if you click on Data Report and Community Profiles, it'll bring up a dropdown menu of every, uh, all 351 cities and towns in, in the Commonwealth, and you can choose your community. And next slide, please. Good morning, Sissy Glass Village. This is Alice. Can I help you? Oh. Good morning, Sissy Glass Village. Can I help you? Have next, oh, there you go. Thanks, Catherine. So, um, so one of the data points when you pull up your community's profile, you'll see, and this is admittedly pre-pandemic <laughs> data, but there's a percentage of uh, adults 60, uh, age 60 and older who use internet in the last month. And so again, while this is pre-pandemic, this gives you an idea of uh, sort of a baseline to work from um, with internet use among older adults in your community. So just something as a, as a talking point and a discussion point with uh, other community, potential community partners. Next slide, please. So another report that's on that website that we shared on digital uh, equity resources is a report from Western Mass, uh, the digital divide and challenges to digital equity. I encourage folks, no matter where you are in the state, um, to take a look at this because it includes lots of examples from lots of different partners and organizations from councils on aging to aging service access points to municipal government, libraries, and all kinds of different sectors of the community it really puts a really uh, it it's it puts a really good framing on the issue, and um, I think will help any community or any community partner articulate the issue well. Next slide, please. And just some opportunity and opportunities and concerns that we've been articulating along the way for you all to think about um, that any approach addressing digital equity should not only consider older adults specifically, but all sectors of a community because older adults participate in all sectors of a community. Um, older adults live in a variety of residential settings, including intergenerational households. Um, skill building policies and programs can be flexible and use existing community assets, should include education around uh, awareness of fraud and scams. And also going back to that first slide from those points from the World Health Organization, recognizing that older adults are already, in many cases, in most cases, proficient users of technology and can serve as a resource to their peers. And we should be recognizing the potential contributions everyone can make. Um, and I know Jocelyn later on will be talking about the 3G shutdown, so I'll skip that on that. But we are available uh, to work with you and your community partners on connecting dots, working with different, um, you know, pointing to different coalitions and models and examples of, you know, folks that have done, uh, you know, done some things that made an impact and made some progress in this work. So um, I'll, I think that's it for me, Catherine. Next slide, just to make sure. Yeah, okay. So this is just my contact info, which I'll put in the chat and our supporters, but um, we're going to continue the conversation. We're going to continue learning from all of you and trying to elevate different examples. And some of those you'll hear uh, later in this presentation. So, so I buzzed through a lot there, but but I'll be um, I'll be around in the chat if you have any other questions. So, thank you Great. very much. Thanks, James. Um, and yes, definitely encourage for. The sake of time, we probably can't do any hard Q and A for um, both of our first two kind of speaker segments. But if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, and I'm sure James, I know your email is here on the beautiful slides, but I'm sure you'll drop that in the chat as well if you haven't already. 
Um, and so next, I wanted to introduce both Tony Schloss and Josh Eichen from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, or MAPC. I'm going to be, I'm doing, I'm trying really hard um, to dissect the alphabet soup, which is a lot of our <laughs> lives nowadays. Um, but both Tony and Josh work at MAPC and have put together a really great presentation to describe how they, from a regional planning agency perspective, have been thinking about digital equity and how they've kind of gone on this journey thinking about digital equity and then, you know, more recently focusing on older adults. And so, uh, Tony and Josh, I'm not sure who's kind of kicking things off, yeah. but Thank I'm happy to drive your slides if you just tell me when to advance. Perfect. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I, will, I will lead off and then I'll throw it over to my colleague, Tony. Um, so, hi, everybody. My name is Josh Eichen. I'm a Senior Economic Development Planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, I have been leading uh, MAPC's work around digital access for about the last two years since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and just as full transparency at the outset here, I'm actually going to be switching roles to join the Mass Broadband Institute in about two weeks, where I'll be continuing this work. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here today, join this coalition, and look forward to hopefully working with everybody moving forward um, in my new capacity uh, as well. So just a little bit of background on MAPC. We're the regional planning agency for the Boston metro area. Um, we work in a lot of different uh, sectors, housing, transportation, economic development, digital access obviously became very important at the onset of the pandemic. Catherine, if you want to take us forward one here, um, uh, for all the reasons that, that James described earlier, um, and, I, and I won't get into too many of them. Um, what I will say uh, before I hand things over to Tony uh, is really that MAPC's work, um, we do a lot of planning work, uh, but we've also been focused on implementation. And so what we're going to talk about uh, more in this presentation is some of our implementation oriented work. I'll take this forward one more, Catherine. Um, and specifically what we'll be describing uh, is the work that we've been doing uh, in establishing um, Wi-Fi, open access Wi-Fi in uh, housing authorities. So uh, MAPC has taken the approach that um, you know, really when we look at things about the digital divide and digital access uh, statewide or regionally, um, housing authorities are a really important place to consider. Um, there's about 90,000 units of low-income housing for families, seniors, and persons with disabilities in the state of Massachusetts. And we know that folks that live in these um, developments often uh, are disconnected households or households that are struggling with affordability or literacy or device access. Take us forward one more. Um, and so the work that we've been doing uh, you know, on the implementation side, working with the partners at three housing authorities that, that Tony will describe is developing a model where we are providing free Wi-Fi uh, in unit um, to uh, two different housing authority properties. Um, and so from a very high level, this is done by purchasing one very high speed internet connection for a building and then linking that one connection to different access points in common areas like stairwells or hallways that then bleed their signal out into units. And so the image on the right side of your screen here is the Prattville Housing Authority Development in Chelsea, which is one of the first places that we're, we're implementing this work. Um, and, and in this way, residents can access free high-speed internet without subscription. We know that subscriptions um, are a barrier to entry for a lot of folks. So you take this one more, Catherine. And so I will turn things over to Tony to talk a little bit about the, the three sites and specifically focusing in on Everett, which is a senior housing property. Thank you, Josh. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tony Schloss. I am the civic technologist here at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And um, though, like many of us, I know some things about technology, but the part that is most interesting and important to me is how that technology interacts with people and their lives. Um, um, as we do that, I think we have to think about specific populations that uh, encounter more challenges and older adults are often one of those um, groups of people. And so as we uh, look at ways to do to impact the most people, uh, this apartment Wi-Fi concept is uh, something we've been working with in a few different sites and we'll continue to do so. But here I'll tell you about how we've gone about doing that in Everett which is 120 units of senior and disabled housing. Um, please, next slide, Catherine. Um, and it's probably very obvious to everyone, but I just want to say that another way to think about this is if you remember when you used to travel 
and you were in maybe airports or hotels and you could get on the Wi-Fi and it worked fast enough for you to do your work and whatever, contact your loved ones, whatever that may be. This is essentially what we're talking about. But what's really important to us and hopefully to all of you is how people can, not only how people connect to the device, I mean, sorry, to internet access through their phones or their computers, but how it interacts with their life in general. You know, there's, as James mentioned, the idea of um, privacy, for example, or security is really important. And I think we need to connect, we, need, we can't allow technology to be something separate from our own lives, you know, and how, and we need to impact how that works. And so to do so, we partnered, uh, we, we were supported um, by the Mystic Valley Elder Services who works in, among other many places in that Glendale Towers. And so we asked Mystic Valley if they would support a survey of their residents to understand if a free Wi-Fi network would be something that those residents would be interested in. So we asked, and do you have internet access? And it splits almost evenly down the middle um, of those that responded to the survey. Um, some did, some didn't. Catherine, please, next slide. And if you have it, is it expensive? And pretty much everybody said, yes, it is, <laughs> um, who had it, um, which is no surprise. So there are other options that um, I believe our final speaker will tell you about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we ask, if you don't have internet, why not? And you can see, hopefully you can see the slide. Many people said it's too expensive um, or they don't have a device. So they have some privacy concerns, but there was a somewhat significant, I mean, we had a small sort of sample size, but a somewhat significant uh, group of people who said they didn't know how to subscribe or don't know how to use the internet or had a language barrier. And I think those are really our target audience for helping to bring them on to use these services to improve their lives and outcomes as James talked about. So next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of those that have internet, what are, they, what are these seniors using it for? And like many of us, they're using it for all sorts of things, not only a little bit of TV, maybe like all of us and to shop like all of us. And that's the stuff that sort of keeps me up at night as I do this work. It's like, am I really doing all this work just to get people to watch Netflix? But I'm not, because as we can see here, uh, older adults are paying their bills and doing telehealth and registering for services, which is pretty much the way and all of these services, all those uh, resources are now online. And so we have to bring people online. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. And so just to put it quick, we won't go too technical, um, but we're happy to follow up with anyone who would like to. This is a sort of technical uh, information on how we do it. So on the left side, you can see those little green spots. Those were, would be sort of access points or antennas. Wi-Fi hotspots would be um, installed. And then with our net, with our technology vendor, they're able to, with um, blueprint information and then access, they can walk through the property with um, sort of uh, like a radio beacon, I should say, and a computer. Let's not get into all the details, but they can then map out what that service will look like, right? And so as you can see with the, in the Glendale Towers with five access points on a floor, for the most part, everyone in almost, you know, 90% of their apartment is going to get relatively good signal. Um, so now we can feel confident that if we want to make this investment, which we will be doing, hopefully with the support of the Housing Authority in Everett and the municipality of Everett, um, will be at this, this technology solution appears to work. Um, next slide, Catherine. I'll turn it back to Josh. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so just to wrap this up here, so that, that's kind of one very specific technology driven element of work um, that we've been doing, but this is within a framework of planning activities that MAPC is engaged in. So we are, we did a, a digital access and equity plan for the city of Everett, as well as Chelsea and Revere, um, and intend to do more in the future that is really designed to help the cities, you know, with their capital investment, their policy, and their program needs. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of couch this very specific piece of work within these like broader planning um, documents, which we are encouraging our cities to engage and we, we feel like cities need to move in this direction. Catherine, you want to take me forward one more? Um, there's this is just an overview of the phases of work that a digital access plan uh, it involves. So you know, working through existing conditions, there's a needs assessment, engaging with community members in this phase is really important with a specific focus on senior population as well as other populations 
infrastructure and technology evaluation, um, and then plan and program development. Um, so this is just a brief overview of the kind of what you might find inside of a uh, digital access or equity plan. And Catherine, if you want to take us forward one more. Um, so yeah, this is that's really us. I know that was again just a ton in a very short period of time, but feel free to reach out to either Tony or myself. Um, and we really appreciate being invited to this group and, and hope to work with folks in the future. And actually, right before I wrap up, one more plug, MAPC also hosts a regional convening on a quarterly basis, which I will send to Catherine and, um, and James to uh, put on your radars. We'd love to bring you all into our work as well. Excellent. Thank you, Josh and Tony, for that amazing presentation. And um, before we flip to the panel, I had a question that's kind of a follow-up for both of you, which is you obviously represent MAPC, but I'm sure that there are a lot of people tuning in today who, you know, maybe have connections with their regional planning agency, maybe not. Like, how can folks learn, like, first of all, who their planning agency is, and then just like, you know, how can they get connected with them to engage in some similar efforts that you guys showcase today? Do you have any advice or James? I know you're very connected with Marpa, so you might have advice too. Um, Catherine, sorry, I was, I was responding to something in the chat, but is the question, how can folks be, get more connected with the work that, that MAPC is doing? Yeah, with MAPC, or if they don't live in that one of the many cities that MAPC covers, how can they learn about their own regional planning agency work and some similar collaboration efforts potentially with their own planning agency? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so I mean, for folks that live in you know the Boston metro area, uh, getting connected with MAPC is as easy as just shooting either Tony or myself an email. I think I dropped our our emails um, in the chat there, um, and then uh, yeah, connecting with the other regional planning agencies. In the state, um, Catherine, you mentioned MARPA, which is the Mass Association of Regional Planning Agencies. I can grab a link to the website there, and, and I can also drop that in the chat. Um, uh, the, uh, the Essex County Community Foundation, as you mentioned, is doing a lot of great work up in Essex County, and there are other digital equity coalitions that are forming in the state. Um, I'm not familiar with all of them, uh, but I think the, you know, we hope, you know, at MAPC, you know, that, that other regional planning agencies will see this work um, and will endeavor in it uh, as well. Um, uh, we feel like RPAs play, should play a you know, critical role in providing this type of you know, resource and technical assistance to communities. Um, but in many ways, they, they kind of need to hear it from community to move into that space. So that's how we got engaged. We heard it from our people. So um, I will post links to the Marple website in a second here. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Excellent. So thank you all for those amazing presentations. We're going to move into the panel um, and we're just going to keep it if folks are okay with it. Um, we're just going to, we're going to keep everyone's tile on the screen. <laughs> so it'll be like we're all in one big virtual room um, and the panelists are kind of seated throughout, which is fun. So I want to introduce our three panelists, Cynthia Wilkerson from Little Brothers Friends of the Elderly in Boston, Nandi Munson from Age Span and Rachel Castle from MAVB. Um, I think I see all three of your little pictures on my screen. Um, but why don't we go ahead and start with introductions. And so I'm gonna ask each one of you to introduce yourselves um, and talk a little bit about your organization, but also if you don't mind, just talk for a minute about your program that really focuses in this space. And so Cynthia, I'll start with you. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for... Uh, including LBFE in this conversation, really happy to be here. Um, I'm Cynthia Wilkerson, I'm the program director at Little Brothers Friends of the Elderly, and we provide uh, services to older adults in Boston. Our focus is primarily on intergenerational engagement and um, tech conversations have been part of our work for the last several years. Um, we have informal gatherings we call tech cafes. We bring older and younger people together and uh, older folks can bring whatever device they have uh, to ask whatever question they might like. And, and so we have, we say we, people bring flip phones to the most current iPhone. It's really a full range of devices that come into tech cafes. Uh, in the last several months, um, post COVID, uh, post COVID, oh my, I wish. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the midst of COVID, let's be realistic. Um, we have um, 
we, as so many other folks have, we, we shifted all of our programs online and it was really clear, really quickly that, um, that the digital divide was, was extremely profound. And so we have in the last uh, several months launched a new program that's expressly focused on tech access. It's called Digital Dividends. We are able, through the support of our funders, we are able to provide a Chromebook to, to all participants. The Chromebook is theirs to keep. We provide a hotspot and internet connectivity for the duration of the program, and then weekly intergenerational tech training. Uh, as part of that uh, of digital dividends and um, digital dividends is focused uh, primarily in public housing. So we work with the public, uh, Boston um, Housing Authority. We also have a relationship with one of the Boston ASAPs that is also doing tech access work um, with Ethos. We um, and then our uh, tech. Uh, tech cafes happen in public and affordable housing, senior centers, and sometimes adult day programs. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Cynthia. And Nandi, can I turn it to you next? Sure. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I'm Nandi Munson. I'm the Outreach Manager for AgeSpan, formerly Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley and North Shore. Uh, we are an aging services access point, so an ASAP, like Cynthia just mentioned, um, and local nonprofit serving the Merrimack Valley and North Shore. Our digital access program launched last summer um, with funding from the NYSource Charitable Foundation and the Wadley Foundation. Um, like everyone here, our program's mission is to help reduce social isolation and loneliness by providing access to a device, training, and internet uh, for those who need it. We're working with older adults, adults with disabilities, and children with disabilities in partnership with Fidelity House, which is another local nonprofit for us. Um, for our funding, our program prioritizes participants in the towns of Lawrence, Andover, and North Andover um, because they were affected by the Columbia gas crisis of 2018. Um, and NYSOR's former Columbia Gas is uh, one of our major funders. But we are serving people from all 28 cities and towns that we serve in our catchment area. Um, what our program actually looks like is we do a one-to-one -one in person training in the participants home most of our participants don't have a device so we're usually providing them with a free tab tablet that's um, theirs to keep ongoing and for our program the goals of the participants are really defined by the participants themselves um, we have some folks who have never ever engaged with technology and want to learn the basics of just simply how do i turn this thing on how can i check my email and then other folks who are more um, eager to learn additional like apps and abilities with the tablet and might wanna participate in social media and virtual programming and games and kind of the whole nine. So our program includes this kind of initial in-person training where we provide a device, um, education on how to use it, kind of work with the participant on goals. Um, and then we're able to provide a data plan for folks who don't have internet at home and that's on a short-term basis, um, just to kind of help remove that barrier for internet access. We do a six month check in with folks after our initial training to make sure that they're doing okay with the tablet, find out if they need additional training. Uh, if they do, we're able to go back out and, and kind of get them to the next level or maybe troubleshoot on issues they might be having with their tablet. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Nandi. And Rachel. Yes. Hi, thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm Rachel Castle. I'm with the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, Access Technology Program. MAVV as a whole offers a lot of different services for people who are blind or visually impaired. We have occupational therapy, um, adjustment counseling, a one-to-one -one volunteer program, and peer support groups. And then our access technology program offers individual and group training um, on technology with a focus on the accessibility tools that are available for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, most of our participants are older adults experiencing age-related vision loss. Um, some may already be familiar with technology, but need to learn new strategies and tools for their changes in vision. Um, others might be newer to technology and are looking to learn how it can help them. So we offer um, continued training for usually around three to six months, and then people can come back in um, for additional support as needed. Wonderful. Thank you. So that's a quick introduction to all three of our panelists and a preview of some of the amazing work that they do in the space. 
Um, for folks uh, joining us today, please feel free, you know, as, as you're thinking about questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll also have like an open kind of Q&A period where we can, you know, review some things before dropping in the chat. Um, or if we have time, maybe ask some folks to unmute themselves and ask questions live. So just wanted to tee that up for everyone um, as we go along. So Cynthia, I'd love to kind of loop back with you since you started first in our introductions. Um, I think all three of your programs, um, Cynthia, Rachel, and Nandi, that you all mentioned words like person-centered, person-directed, like a person could bring, you know, an old school flip phone from like 1990 up through the latest iPhone. I forgot what count we're on in the double digits. So I'm <laughs> just curious, like, you know, in, in helping folks understand the technology and learn how to use it in a way that enriches their life, like what does that look like in practice? And Cynthia, I know you have a lot of different programs that kind of address the modality of ways, but if you want to give one example, I'd love to just like put a finer point on what that actually looks like. Well, I, I'll give you an example from a, a, a training I was, I was able to attend yesterday at a senior uh, building, uh, a, a, a BHA building in the South End. We had um, uh, just, uh, the second session people a lot of participants were part of our fall session they're returning in the spring where the bha's community rooms have been closed for weeks and they've just recently reopened so we had um uh, a group of uh, residents who speak mandarin cantonese uh or taishanese um in one part of the room we had several folks who for whom english is their first language in another area. And we always try to, as much as possible, bring people together across language barriers, across cultural differences, because that's what um, um, communities look like in public and affordable housing. They're diverse, they're complex. They, um, people have really different lived experience and we're trying to build connections neighbor to neighbor, as well as intergenerational connections. And now with the focus on, um, tech access, uh, I think there was, there were probably 12 different conversations going on in several different languages. Uh, one, one participant is actually quite um, tech savvy. And so I was talking to her about doing outreach, being becoming one of our digital um, ambassadors and really reminding her neighbors that if they're interested in accessing technology, it's, it's really possible and it's really worth it. Um, I think we just, we had um, folks uh, working in Mandarin and Cantonese um, with support um, from um, students from Bunker Hill Community, Bunker Hill Community College, and um, and and it was it's very uh, still very tailored and individualized. And I think with with for adult learners and adult learners who come to us with such different lived experience, that's crucial. Um, our rubrics, our learning rubrics, are always around engagement connection and um, if people if people feel that they have more information than they started so we use pretty broad uh, a set of uh, of um, metrics and I think that uh, for a really community-based very grassroots organization that's really important um, and and we um, are really driven by what program participants say they want and if they don't know quite, the questions to ask, then we try to step in and say, make some suggestions, but then always really turn it back to the to the participant to say, yes, that's the direction I want to go in. Nope, this is really where I'd like to learn. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. You touched on a lot of really important themes there, and we might circle back to some of them, um, but that was really great. And I saw both Nandi and Rachel shaking their heads. And Nandi, I was actually wondering if I could come to you because um, in kind of adopting a one-on-one, -on -one, like going into the home, like very person-directed approach, that is clearly honoring sort of the older person's values and sort of meeting them where they are. But I think when it comes to sort of the support that you as age span give to your resources who are the folks going into the home to do that kind of support and training, you know, that, that puts a lot of ask as far as like the breadth of understanding different technology and different software, different apps. Could you touch on that for a little bit? Like what has your experience been since you started this program last summer and, and where, where is your current thinking as it relates to that? Sure, that's a really good question. 
So because our program is so person centered and um, we could be inter interacting with participants in like a really wide variety of ways, like somebody may need a tablet and training and a data plan, or somebody may just need the tablet or they might just need training. And we're going into the homes and people have such a wide variety of um, experiences with technology like along the spectrum. Um, so I think, frankly, we really won the staffing lottery with a coordinator who really is like the perfect balance of being able to work wonderfully with our with our population and also having like that tech savvy and being really um, adept at like going from device to device and different tablets and working with somebody on a laptop. So I think that has been a huge um, asset to our program. We also have a, a few of our outreach staff who are helping with the program and a wonderful volunteer as well. Um, and they all were kind of bringing the same skill set to the table where they're able to be really nimble and, and um, adapt the training like really person by person. Um, I think part of like the spirit of the program for us having, being in the middle of unrolling it is just really maintaining like an openness of flexibility, um, I always kind of joke with my outreach team, like, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, sometimes even in the moment having to tailor what you thought was going to happen at that training based on you've screened the person over the phone to find out what they want to do, what they're interested in, what their prior experience with technology might be. But when you show up, it might be a very different story. Um, so that kind of, again, coupled with unrolling this in the middle of the pandemic and doing one-on-one -on -one person, you know, in-person trainings in somebody's home brings a whole nother set of variables in with COVID protocol and safety and um, close contact and all of that, as you can all imagine, you're all living it as well. Um, so yeah, it's been a real challenge, but I think, again, part of what's working really well for us is having a team that is just really flexible and they have like kind of the heart and mind to be able to um, navigate in this program that's like really fluid to our approach being so kind of person centered. That's wonderful. Thanks, Nandi. It does sound like you hit the jackpot there on the uh, staffing. So. <laughs> um, but I, I love your tips for us as far as, you know, for folks on this call who might be looking to either start similar positions or expand on similar positions like that type of willingness to kind of like, you know, roll the sleeves and learn something new and have that flexibility and like the heart and mind piece of it. I really love that. Um, so I'm taking that away from that. Thank you. Rachel, I'd love to turn to you because I know MAVV is unique and that it offers sort of, you know, similar to what Cynthia and Nandi talked about, like this one-on-one, -on -one, very like person-directed approach. But then you also do group sessions. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the group aspect of it and how um, the approach there is a little bit different than the one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, absolutely. So our group programs, um, they were actually started in response to the pandemic. We saw so many community programs being moved on to Zoom and kind of recognized that a lot of our clients might need some additional support learning to use this new to them and new to us to an extent technology. Um, so once we got everyone connected to Zoom for the first time, we had a bunch of Zoom on Zoom sessions um, where we introduced the different features, muting and unmuting, starting and stopping video, um, chat, raising hands, all of those, and then gave everyone the opportunity to practice in a really low risk environment. You know, I was never going to be like, you didn't raise your hand, you can't ask your question. So it was very casual. Um, from there, they really took off and everybody really liked joining. So we started talking about different technology topics, um, audiobooks and podcasts, grocery delivery apps, um, other accessibility tools, uh, and so much more. Um, and so beyond learning about technology, those groups have been a really good place for social connection and for people to share their experiences and um, resources that they've found. Managing different needs in the group session um, has definitely been a learning experience. Um, I, in general, try to keep it um, to a more broad overview of what's possible with the technology. So tell them, you know, you can order groceries. Here's kind of a little bit of how to navigate the app. And then I actually do um, follow up with individual training um, for people who are really interested in learning that. Um, and then within the group session, I still leave plenty of time for questions and answers, um, the whole time being mindful of, you know, how much can I answer here and how much of this do I need to 
pull aside into a, a separate one on one session. Um, and then finally, we do some open discussion sessions every once in a while, where I just encourage people to bring any and all technology questions they might have. Um, it's a great opportunity to um, hear what people have been doing with their technology, what they've been reading about, and then identify some areas where people would like to learn more. Great. Thanks, Rachel. That's great advice for folks who might be um, looking to try different modalities of training and support for folks. And um, I love that we're able to kind of showcase different approaches to the same goal. So I, I think it's really great what Mavi's been doing. And a common theme that I know folks are sort of like sick of talking about, but you all mentioned that, you know, somehow the pandemic like affected your program. Um, and Nandi, I guess you were you started during the pandemic. So um, extra kudos to you for taking this on during, during a very hard time. But Cynthia, I was actually wondering if you could just tell us your perspective on, you know, LBFE's programming in this space. I know digital dividends is um, a little newer, but you've been doing tech programming and training for a long time. And the pandemic obviously threw extra hurdles and kind of, you know, as things open, closed, open, closed, like it's been hard for all of us um, to manage our programs. But I think when you're dealing with tech training, like it's especially hard. And so I don't know if you had any comments on that um, or any like lessons learned that you wanted to share with the group. I think to be really honest and, and transparent, I think for us, um, if right now for digital dividends, which is focused on ex exclusively on tech access, if we weren't able to be in person, we would be really quite challenged because so many of our participants are, this is the first time that they have picked up a device. And um, they may have a, a, a flip phone or a smartphone, but I think I've been with folks that I've thought, I want, you know, I wonder if, have you ever sat in front of a, a keyboard before? Did you, have you ever sat in front of a, a typewriter before? And, and I think some of our participants, um, um their 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 uh, uh literacy is um is somewhat limited and and so so there would be very very real challenges to working with such new adopters um what we in the really the throes of the pandemic early on what we were able to do was uh, through um, the support of the H Strong Commission was distribute tablets to program participants, Wi-Fi enabled tablets. And I think that, um, and in buildings where there was a resident service coordinator or other uh, resident support staff that were able to uh, help get those devices directly to folks and um, having that um, consistency of device made, um, Zoom, getting people onto Zoom and getting people engaged with Zoom more possible. But for, to be honest, I, I think that to, to do more in-depth tech training for new users virtually, I, I think it would be it, not impossible, nothing's impossible, but we would have had to scale our ambitions back considerably. Um, so, uh, but all that, it's also to say uh, we've also seen new users who um, they figured it out. And I think that's another thing to remember is that we're working with people who are resilient, they have life experience, they have um, determination and uh, don't, don't count anybody out. Uh, so it is possible, but it's challenging. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Being real, but aspects of hope there for sure. And um, Rachel, I wonder if you want to add on to any comments from Cynthia, because I know Mavi is in a similar position where I feel like you you started the tech training prior to COVID, but then your program like blew up <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of thought and a lot of different delivery methods because of the opening and closing. Do you have any anything that you wanted to add? Um. I would just agree with Cynthia that it is challenging, certainly not impossible. You know, we were doing training 100% remote for um, a year and a half, um, but you have to be very creative. Sometimes um, 
we would be talking to someone on a landline um, while they're working on their tablet and then trying to get a screen share going on the tablet so that I could follow along. Um, so just being very, very creative in what you're working on and very patient to um, take the time to have them describe what's on the screen. Um, for, the, for us, um, we have a lot of people who are using screen readers, so they're actually mm -hmm. accessing everything through audio. And in some ways that made it easier because they don't have to describe what's on the screen. I'm hearing everything that their device is saying. Um, so that was actually a, a big help for us in the remote training, but patience and creativity is the big thing that, that got us through everything. Thanks, Rachel. And now um, switching gears a little bit, we've, we've been talking a lot about the training. And I think that's really important because training is I think where there's like so many different approaches and um, it's where a lot of like the special sauce kind of lies with a lot of this digital equity and aging programming. But Nandi, I want to come to you next because you mentioned um, in your intro about your program that you've been really thoughtful about sort of like the internet access piece. And I was just wondering if you had any advice or any comments on sort of how you are approaching that. Um, I know just kind of anecdotally that a lot of folks are sometimes hesitant, honestly, to start some of this type of programming because there is a concern that, oh, we're giving kind of like free devices or free internet for a period of time, and then it goes away. Um, and as James had teed up very nicely at the beginning, like acknowledging that technology access and internet access is a social determinant of health. We can't just, you know, rip things out from under folks. So do you have any comments on that? Because I feel like HSPAN has been really thoughtful in their approach here. Sure. Um, yeah, we're kind of in the middle of, of, we have a plan, but we're kind of in the middle of figuring it out in real time. So for our program, we're able to provide a data plan on the tablets, the free tablets that we're providing for up to a year for people. Um, and then at the year mark or at the six month mark, if they're kind of ready to transition, our coordinator and our, our staff and volunteer working on this program can help people like transition to other like broadband programs and resources. Um, and I, I'm excited, you know, even just hearing today about like, there's a lot of growth in that. We're going to see so many more things, I think, over the next few months and year, which makes me really happy. But in the meantime, um, I think for us being able to provide a data plan as part of our program for people, it kind of helps build some momentum for folks. Like, you know, it's not, okay, here's a tablet. Let me figure out how to get you internet access now. And look at an application and go through that process. And even if that process is really low barrier, it's still another step that, that we're able to kind of like, you know, put a, hit the pause button on for now. And just like, let's get, let's get these folks tablets that work today, that have internet access today. Um, and then again, kind of build some confidence and, and their ability to use the, you know, their ability and desire to use the device and then like once they kind of get the hang of it, then we'll be able to jump in and again, like help identify what other resources are, are available in the community for ongoing, sustainable, long-term internet, which again, I think the timing, I'm hopeful that it's gonna work out really well to, again, as we hear about some of the programs that are, that are coming online. Wonderful, thanks, Nandi. Um, and I wanna be conscious of time and I feel like we could dive so much deeper with our panelists about their programs, but, um, I was thinking maybe we wrap up with like a little bit of a lightning round. Um, if you each don't mind sharing, we cover a lot of different things. If you each don't mind sharing kind of like one piece of advice or one like really significant lesson learned that we haven't touched on yet that you want to share with this audience, I'd, I'd love to go there next. Um, and while that's happening, just reminding folks, please feel free. Either you could direct message me in the chat or you could just share it with everybody. But if you have questions that you want to make sure um, get answered, we could spend maybe like five, seven minutes on that before we turn to Jocelyn to close out our segment. Um, so please just be thinking as, as we do this lightning round. So Cynthia, I'm gonna start with you. What is your kind of like final piece of advice or final takeaway that you want folks to walk away from this from? As uh, folks in aging services, we need to be advocates and uh, always reminding everyone that older adults need, want, have to have access and uh, should be part of every conversation and concern and, and uh, make sure that the tech space is an age-friendly space. I love that. Rachel, go to you next. Yeah, so for me, it's that um, in technology, one size does not necessarily fit all. Um, the right device or training style 
um, has to be unique to the accessibility needs and the learning style of the individual. So you kind of have to tailor your programs for every person. Absolutely. Thanks, Rachel. And Nandi, I would last say, but not least. Thank you, Catherine. I would say if you're in the middle of like unrolling or starting a program like this, um, just remember to take moments to step back and assess like what's working for participants and what's not and allow yourself and your program room to adjust course, you're going to have to. Um, and just kind of fostering like a really open-minded, curious, observant stance to be able to um, kind of make those course adjustments. Wonderful, thanks Nandi. And I'm looking at the chat and we have a couple questions. So I think I'm gonna ask two, um, so that's all the time that we have. I wanna be sure that we get to Jocelyn. Um, so the first question is, about like kind of, I think some of you touched upon this, but would love to be a little more explicit, like this gaining momentum and like creating confidence in folks that, you know, maybe are just dabbling in some of these technologies for the first time. Like, sounds like it might be a little bit of, it depends is gonna be the answer, but <laughs> would love any, any response or any guidance from you all and how you kind of make sure that older adults are quickly gaining that confidence as they participate in your programs. That's an open question. So anyone who wants to answer, feel free to go off mute. I see the gears turning. I, I'll say uh, I have, we had, uh, we were working uh, doing uh, uh, typing exercises with some participants and um, there was a uh, typing and also just uh, um, screen maneuvering screens you know sliding moving left right and one participant was uh, went through all the exercises and at the end there was a certificate and he was so a certificate of completion he was so delighted and actually asked the resident service coordinator the property manager could he print it um so i think that you know those exercises that um both the support and encouragement of classmates and other uh, uh, participants, it's great, but also programs and opportunities that build in the incentives, like we all like to be told, good job, you did it. And, and you could really feel like I've accomplished something, I've completed something successfully. Oh, I love that story. Thanks, Cynthia. And um, the second question that was asked in the chat is just to get sort of like, a, I think a general sizing of like how big your programs are as far as like staff support and then like how many people you are supporting. So kind of on the older adult side. So might be a hard question to answer because I think some of you operate like many different tech programs, but like Nandi, maybe I can start with you because I think we started talking about this the other day um, as far as like number of staff at age span and then the, very big number of people that you all are serving in the Merrimack Valley North Shore area. It's kind of like a good news, bad news thing. I mean, our program has received just an overwhelming um, amount of interest and, and support. And, you know, we started it last summer and we've had over like 330 people reach out to us and, and say, sign me up for this program. I want to participate. We have, you know, one coordinator designated for this program who's amazing. Um, and we have, you know, a few of our staff kind of able to step in here and there to help with some trainings and a wonderful volunteer. Um, it's a challenge to keep up with the interest and I think it's going to continue to grow. So we're, you know, we're, we're figuring it out in, in real time, but it's again, like it's, I think it's a good, it's a good problem to have, right? That's what I would, yeah, it's kind of our over cap. Definitely. Thanks, Maddie. And Cynthia, Rachel, do you want to chime in as well as, as being of the pre-pandemic crowd of having a program and seeing it grow during this time? Yeah, so I think we have like, we serve around 125 to 150 people per year um, with Navi. That's kind of across the state. So we're, I think up to eight training centers. Um, of course, COVID is making that number fluctuate by the week. Um, but those training centers um, will all have a coordinator and then some volunteers um, actively doing the training. Wonderful. And then Cynthia, for I don't know if you want to just focus on digital dividends, um, if you can give any like stats on that, because um, it'd be interesting to, to understand how 
big <laughs> it is. Sure. So for digital dividends, we have a full-time program manager who's a fabulous, and I would say we also got that jackpot. Um, she's wonderful. And um, we are still in the pilot phase. We have, uh, because uh, so many buildings had the community rooms were closed when we were uh, launching our spring session. We had to, um, we had a couple of buildings queued up, but we had to say we'll have to wait just because, as we were discussing earlier, trying to do things virtually, it just did not seem really feasible. So we have, um, we're in four buildings in this pilot with, and we've just added a fifth session. So we have two sessions in one building. And um, I, we're just kind of finalizing our participant numbers. We should have between 50 and 55 people across those buildings. Um, we, our hope is for that one program manager to ultimately be managing uh, sites at 10 buildings. Uh, we hope to be able to be there in the next year, year and a half. And then we have, um, because it's our intergenerational focus, we are working with service learning and community engagement students and um, and so there is a management lift on onboarding them, but they really provide the the um, a lot of the support in the sessions. And I think we have about uh, fifteen about fifteen students at the different sites. Excellent. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, all three of you, for participating in this panel. And um, I know we could have gone a lot longer, but it was really wonderful to get your insight from, you know, different different types of approaches. And um, I think what I'm taking away is like, my goodness, it takes a village <laughs> to do this right. <laughs> because you all mentioned different type of support, whether it's staff, volunteers, uh, peers, students, um, all different types of ways of meeting people where they are and really honoring person-directed training. Um, so just kudos to you and your program managers and your staff and volunteers because this is incredible work. So thank you. Wonderful. And if folks have qu more questions um, that we like either didn't get to or that you want to direct message to any of our panelists, like please feel free. Um, and I'm sure all three of them would be very open to connecting uh, outside of this session if you have any more specific questions about other programs or want advice for your own programs. Um, I'd like to switch gears and invite Jocelyn, who I see on video, Jocelyn Day, uh, to introduce herself and go through her presentation, which um, I kind of specifically slimmed the broadband internet discussion in the panel because I knew that we would spend a lot of time with that and the 3G phase out with Jocelyn. So um, Jocelyn, I'm happy to bring your slides up and drive those for you. Um, you just tell me when to advance. Great, awesome. Um, you can go ahead and put the slide up. I'm gonna stop my video. So the focus will be on um, the uh, slides. So I want to first say uh, good afternoon, everyone. This has really been an informative meeting, and I appreciate being part of this forum. I'm learning a lot and uh, certainly see where uh, collaboration uh, can be with my agency as well as uh, many of you. So a lot of good information and expertise in the room. My name is Jocelyn Day. I am the Consumer Division Director at the Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Um, and I'm happy to share some updates with you regarding issues impacting consumers, but especially older adults um, that you should be aware of involving changes to the wireless technology and newly created federal benefit programs to help close the digital divide. Next slide, please. So let me introduce you, for those of you who don't know the Department of Telecommunications and Cable and what we do. We are a state regulatory agency within the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. We oversee and monitor or regulate the landline telecommunication and cable industries in the Commonwealth in conjunction with federal and state laws. Um, currently, there are 267 telecommunication companies that are registered to do business in the Commonwealth with us. And there are seven cable operators serving the state that fall within our jurisdiction. Next slide, please. 
The consumer division, um, we are really the front line of the DTC. We work to make sure that the consumer protection rules and laws that are available to Massachusetts consumers are uh, enforced. That means to make sure that providers, service providers, whether they are telecom or cable providers, actually um, comply with those rules and that consumers know their rights. We investigate disputes that consumers have with their service provider. Our telephone number does appear on the back of every telephone and cable operator's bill under the right to dispute your bill section. Um, we also advise the, the commissioner on policy matters and industry trends. And one of the reasons why I'm here today is we provide consumer education and outreach. We wanna make sure that the community knows about issues impacting um, communication services. Next slide, please. So broadband connectivity, we all know now is a vital a part of our lives for work, school, healthcare, and so much more. The federal government's newly created broadband discount program assists low income households afford the cost of internet. So families who previously could not get online or struggle to pay for what has become essential or, necess necess essential or necessity services are now able to get connected via the Affordable Connectivity Program or what we call ACP. Next slide, please. And what the ACP is, is a long-term benefit program that Congress mandated that the FCC put in place to replace the emergency broadband benefit or EBB, which was a temporary benefit program created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That program, EBB, ended on December 31st, 2021. There was a transition period for households enrolled in EBB until Tuesday, March 1st, and now those folks are automatically transferred to the ACP as long as they are still eligible. So ACP, like I said, is really a benefit to help those low income households afford broadband service in their homes. ACP provides a discount on the monthly internet bill and a one-time discount toward the purchase of a connected device. That could be a laptop, desktop, or tablet from a participating provider, as long as the consumer has a co-payment of more than $10 and less than 50 toward the price. Next slide, please. And then the last thing I'll just say about the EC ACP before we get into the shutdown is that last month, the White House announced that there were 10 million households enroll enrolled in ACP. Approximately 150,000 of those are Massachusetts households. We know though that there are more households that are eligible and can benefit from ACP. So outreach about this program is vital. DTC distributes APC applications and information to consumers. So feel free to contact our office or send consumers our way if you need information or resources. Um, whereas we'd like to get as many people enrolled in this program and take advantage of this benefit uh, as much as possible to lessen the gaps in um, connectivity. Also, if you'd like to become an FCC outreach partner, the FCC is, is uh, encouraging uh, community organizations and others to become an outreach partner for ACP, you can enroll at fcc.gov backslash ACP. So let's work together to bridge the broadband gaps for eligible households and get them enrolled in ACP. Now let's talk about the wireless technology update, the 3G shutdown. You may have already heard about the uh, shutdown of the three major wireless carriers, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, of their plans to shut down their 2G and 3G networks in 2022. Um, basically, wireless technology has evolved. Um, we're up to 4G, moving toward 5G. Um, so those platforms or those technologies are evolving and companies want to shut down the older Technology networks to make room for the newer uh, technologies. So um, what's happening? AT&T actually shut down their network um, on February 22nd. 
T-Mobile plans to shut down their Sprint network um, by March 31st and the T-Mobile 3G network July 1st, 2022. And Verizon says by December 31st, 2022, they will decommission their 3G network. So what's important to note, while these are the three major wireless carriers, um, there are other carriers that ride over or use the rent the space on those wireless carriers network that some folks might not think that they're impacted. So companies like Cricket, Consumer Cellular, Lively, Mint, Boost, Track, Phone, Straight Talk, SafeLink, you may have heard um, a few of these, there are a host of others, but those companies are also going to be impacted by the 3G shutdown. So we need to make sure that older adults are aware if they subscribe to services with those providers, then their services uh, may be um, impacted as well. Next slide, please. Once the carrier shuts down the 3G network, older cell phones and devices will not work, including 911. So this is a critical infrastructure piece for the safety of our residents. Phones are not the only devices that depend on 3G technology. There are medical emergency devices, home security systems, tablets, smart watches, and the list goes on, as you can see there, may also be affected. So again, consumers need to be aware uh, if they have these devices and they're running on the 3G technology that they will lose connectivity once the, the service shuts down. The manufacturers of all these devices they are notifying customers to upgrade the devices before the shutdown. So mobile devices older than the iPhone 6 or the Samsung Galaxy S4 are likely to require an upgrade. Next slide, please. So what are we to do? Um, it's happening. There is no uh, stopping it. Um, these companies, like I said, are making um, room for the newer, faster technologies and the benefits that 4G and 5G will bring. So we just need to spread the word to consumers that may be impacted. Um, contact your mobile provider. Find out if your phone will no longer be supported. Contact the manufacturer of your device to see if you need to get a new medical alert or home security system and, and the like. Um, respond to the provider's messages. Wireless providers have been really aggressive in contacting their subscribers to let them know about the street to shut down. Um, but unfortunately, some people don't respond to texts, text messages or letters. So we need to get the word out that if the provider contacts you to make sure you respond. And then there's a role for community organizations and state agencies to utilize platforms and resources to educate networks and organizations to make sure that uh, folks do not lose access to the wireless network before the carrier shuts down their network. Next slide, please. So I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, but I want to convey, and I, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here to, with you to give you those two updates, um, but please feel free to reach out to the DTC. We are here to help you with any and all communication services issues. So we operate a hotline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We provide complete uh, complaint mediation. Again, if you know folks that can't get through to their wireless provider to get an upgraded device or to talk about what they need to do before the shutdown um, or really any other issue or ACP trying to get enrolled, um, those are the kinds of issues and inquiries that we definitely can help and um, help address resolve. And then lastly, we have some materials and information um, to provide uh, resources and education on various uh, topics. Um, whether it be consumer protection laws and rules and, and informing consumers what their rights are, uh, we have an outreach program that we uh, go out to communities either in person or virtually. So again, thank you for the opportunity to um, be here today and um, a lot of good work that this group is doing and I look forward to uh, being involved with you all. All right, I'm hopping in to say thank you on behalf of Catherine and Molly Jocelyn. You've been such a great partner in keeping us informed throughout all of this. So thank you so much for the continued updates and information for providing an education to all of us. 
Um, and so I put uh, the DTC consumer resources information in the chat for anybody that wants to access those. But I also want to go uh, rewind a little bit and thank the panelists, thank uh, Catherine for being a great moderator, and thank the MAPC team that I think already departed. Um, but I hope everybody sees the, the value of all of the, this kind of cross-sharing that we're doing to keep each other informed and the value that that provides. And, and so, uh, you know, we're hoping that this will all enable us to take better action collectively when, you know, funding and opportunities and policy uh, opportunities come from the state or federal level uh, that we can kind of collectively act. So um, there's going to be a, a lot being shared with you uh, back, including the recording, the slides, uh, and this will all be put on uh, the uh, Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative's website. Um, we may also find a spot for it on the uh, on a different website for the task force. Catherine and Molly will have to think about, about that one. But um, but in any case, we are available to answer questions and to kind of help you connect dots in your communities or regions. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of regional coalition building that's happening to get different groups of communities prepared for uh, for what's coming. There will also be a report from the state's broadband equity commission uh, that was set to come out at some point this month. So something else to watch for in those recommendations. Uh, we've made comments using some of the examples you heard today from the panelists um, on just some of the ways uh, communities and organizations are getting older adults involved. But please continue to keep in touch with us. I think we're gonna have a Google form that's gonna be shared at some point. Uh, and there it is, as, as far as topics for our next meetings and the content of these meetings, what you all wanna hear about, what you're curious about, but, um, but I wanna emphasize again, uh, the great work of meeting people where they are, being flexible and uh, you know, trying to work with community partners to get things done. So with that, um, I think we are all done for today. So woohoo, yep, Nandy, <laughs> Nandy put up the uh, the confetti. So with that, we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day, Catherine. Anything else I missed? No, nothing else. Uh, just really wanted to say thank you. I know that as we've lived through COVID, being on ninety minute Zoom sessions can be a lot. Um, but we really are hosting this forum for you. And so when I say it, I mean it. Like please, if you have ideas or um, suggestions for the next time, drop us a note. Like we really want to make sure this space is meeting your needs. Um, so looking forward to collaborating. We'll probably have another meeting in the summer um, and it'll be hopefully a whole different set of circumstances as it relates to <laughs> the pandemic and other environmental factors, but really looking forward to reconnecting and thank you everyone for your time.